dear ministers, dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a honor for us to have this event tonight, and I will uh, ask uh, Philippe Ouzé, who is the chairman of EVCP, to come here to make an introduction. Bien, bonjour mesdames et bonjour messieurs, monsieur le ministre, madame l'ambassadeur, monsieur le président de la chambre de commerce du Luxembourg, cher Luc, monsieur le président de la chambre de commerce d'Île-de-France n'est pas encore arrivé, cher Didier, qui nous rejoindra certainement, mesdames et messieurs les membres de la chambre de commerce du Luxembourg et d'Île-de-France, Mesdames et messieurs les administrateurs de ESCP, mesdames et messieurs les membres de l'International Advisory Board, monsieur le président de la fondation ESCP, cher Christian, oui, c'est là, euh, monsieur euh, le directeur général de ESCP, cher Franck, chers professeurs, chers collaborateurs de l'école, chers étudiants, chers amis, quel plaisir, mais aussi quelle émotion de vous accueillir dans les murs de notre école, Monsieur le ministre, vous, le porte-parole de l'Union européenne sous présidence luxembourgeoise, lors de la signature du protocole de Kyoto. Nous vous sommes, nous vous sommes très reconnaissants de venir ainsi à la rencontre de nos étudiants et n'ayons pas peur des mots de la communauté ESCP tout entière, comme le démontre la diversité de cette assemblée. Monsieur le ministre, j'ai personnellement veillé à ce que l'école finalise un travail de refonte de son modèle de leadership et de ses valeurs, afin d'être mieux entendu dans sa définition d'un nouveau capitalisme axé sur le développement au long terme, nourri par des choix responsables et l'innovation technologique. Or, le Luxembourg, Luxembourg où j'y compte de nombreux amis, et j'espère un jour en passe de devenir l'épicentre de cette nouvelle finance positive européenne, à la fois verte et avec un impact sociétal. Quant à l'innovation technologique, durable et fiable que je mentionnais, nous suivons tous ici de près le projet conjoint EuroHPC, HPC for High Performance Computing qui rayonne en Europe depuis le Luxembourg. Nous nous réjouissons que son budget ait été signific significativement augmenté en ce mois de septembre pour atteindre 8 milliards d'euros. À l'instar du succès d'Airbus, je suis persuadé que les synergies permises par cette nouvelle joint undertaking attirera de nombreux diplômés ESCP. Cette intégration européenne renforcé que vous prenez est au cœur de notre modèle ESCP. Et j'appelle au travail en bonne intelligence de trois générations d'entrepreneurs présentes ici pour faire face à ce défi et particulièrement à leur capacité et leur désir d'apprendre. Quel honneur de constater que ce projet n'est pas seulement le vôtre, celui de notre école, mais que les États tels que le vôtre partageaient également les ambitions d'une société plus prospère et plus juste. À cet égard, je vous renouvelle l'expression de mon admiration et de notre reconnaissance de porter ainsi au plus haut niveau les profondes aspirations des générations d'entrepreneurs que nous formons. Je cède à cet égard la parole à Bertrand Moinjon, directeur général adjoint en charge de la formation continue, initiateur de cette belle série de conférences Stand Up, for a sustainable world. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur le Président. Um, now I have the pleasure to call on stage Mr. Pierre Gramegna, Minister of Finances of Luxembourg. The topic of his presentation is post-COVID 
solidarity and sustainability are shaping the future of the European Union. Je voulais montrer que j'ai amené un masque, mais euh, je crois que pour euh, faire ce discours, il faudra s'en passer. Euh, excellence, euh, Madame l'Ambassade, euh, Monsieur le Président, euh, Ouzé, merci pour vos gentils mots d'introduction, Monsieur le Directeur Général euh, de, de SCP, et puis, je vais dire, euh, monsieur le président de la Chambre de commerce, euh, monsieur le ministre, en France, en tout cas, on est une fois ministre, on est toujours ministre. Euh, je ne sais pas si c'est comme ça au Luxembourg, mais enfin, comme je connais bien Luc Frieden, ça me fait plaisir de m'adresser à lui comme monsieur le ministre. Euh, monsieur le directeur général de la Chambre de commerce, euh, donc, euh, chers amis euh, qui, qui êtes venus du Luxembourg à cette occasion, euh, chers étudiants, c'est avec beaucoup d'émotion que je m'adresse à vous. Je sais bien que je fais déjà une erreur protocolaire puisqu'on m'a demandé de m'exprimer en anglais, mais ne vous inquiétez pas, j'y viens. Mais avant de parler anglais, euh, je voudrais euh, commencer en, en disant que je me sens très honoré et privilégié d'avoir été invité et puis de recevoir le titre de docteur Renoris Causa. Ça n'arrive pas tous les jours, mais ça me fait particulièrement plaisir que ça se passe à Paris qui est une ville qui est très proche de mon cœur et de ma famille. Ma, grand, ma mère est née dans cette ville, j'y ai fait euh, mes études, j'y ai rencontré ma femme, et notre fille est née, est née à Paris. Euh, vous vous rendez bien compte que cette ville est très proche de mon cœur, et donc c'est très émouvant que ce soit ici qu'on me décerne mon premier docteur honoris causa à l'étranger. La raison pour laquelle je voulais parler français, c'était pour euh, faire une introduction sur, sur deux points qui, qui sont directement liés au sujet, mais peut-être euh, pas évidents. Le premier, c'est est-ce qu'il fallait maintenir cette conférence Réponse oui. Pourquoi Mais parce qu'elle est organisée dans le respect des règles, dans le respect des gestes barrières et des distances. Mais si on raisonnait comme on l'a fait il y a quelques mois, partout en Europe et dans le monde, on se serait dit, mieux vaut rester chez soi, ne pas se déplacer pour prendre aucun risque. Mais je crois qu'entre-temps, on se rend compte d'une chose très simple, c'est que le virus il est là pour rester et qu'il, malheureusement, il sera parmi nous encore des mois et vraisemblablement encore l'année prochaine, et qu'il faut apprendre à vivre avec lui et tirer les leçons de ce qui nous arrive. Au dernier Ecofin, un, un représentant d'un think tank a fait la remarque suivante que j'ignorais totalement, j'espère que ce sera pour vous aussi une première. Il disait la guerre, la, la Première Guerre mondiale a fait de très nombreuses victimes, mais... La grippe espagnole qui a sévi à la fin de la Première Guerre mondiale a fait plus de victimes que toutes celles de la Première Guerre mondiale. Or, on a écrit, paraît-il, dit cet expert, 40 000 livres sur la Première Guerre mondiale. Et on a écrit 400 livres sur la grippe espagnole. Donc on a tendance à ne pas tirer la leçon de ces pandémies qui euh, ont malheureusement euh, créer des dommages et coûter des vies depuis des siècles sur la planète, euh, avant Jésus-Christ et après Jésus-Christ. Donc il faut apprendre à vivre avec. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire Ça veut dire qu'il faut faire dans la nuance. Alors ceux qui me connaissent un peu savent que je suis un photographe amateur, que j'aime bien développer mes photos et noir et blanc. En noir et blanc, c'est bien le noir et le blanc, mais il y a des millions de tonalités de gris entre. Et la politique, la bonne politique, c'est de trouver les bonnes solutions pragmatiques qui fonctionnent. Et dans un cas comme celui-ci, dans une pandémie, eh bien, il faut pas à pas affronter les défis et les résoudre et ne pas s'étonner qu'après une semaine, on, a, on ait appris de nouvelles choses et qu'il faille prendre d'autres décisions. 
il faut constater qu'une situation d'urgence comme celle-ci a bousculé nos habitudes, a projeté le télétravail sur l'avancée, apprendre à utiliser cela intelligemment et en même temps se rendre compte qu'on ne pourra pas, après la pandémie, vivre comme avant et en même temps on ne pourra pas mettre la terre entière en télétravail. Donc à nouveau, équilibre. Cette crise, où pendant des mois l'économie mondiale était au ralenti, nous a montré que l'activité humaine a un impact sur la planète. Il y en a qui en doutent. Je n'insiste pas sur celui qui est le plus connu et qui en doute, mais il est clair que les deux, trois mois d'activité réduite ont amélioré la, la, la santé de la planète d'une manière extraordinaire. Tirons-en des leçons, et ça, c'est relié, bien sûr, au sujet auquel je vais bientôt m'adonner dans la langue de Shakespeare. Il y a une deuxième chose que je voulais dire en introduction, parce qu'elle sera absente euh, du sujet, mais pour montrer comment j'ai appris ça à Paris 2, on fait un plan en deux parties. Dans l'introduction, il faut exclure et dire qu'on a vu le risque, mais qu'on ne va pas le traiter. Et c'est que le sujet regarde vers l'intérieur. Comment l'Europe peut-elle être plus solidaire et favoriser la finance soutenable C'est un sujet qui regarde beaucoup vers l'intérieur, ce qu'on peut faire nous-mêmes. Mais je voulais quand même, dans l'introduction, dire un mot sur le rôle de l'Europe dans le monde. Le Luxembourg étant très petit, pays fondateur de la plupart des institutions internationales qui ont été créées après la guerre, n'a jamais eu la folie des grandeurs. Il a tout de suite compris, par la force des choses, qu'il devait s'agréger à d'autres pays, au Benelux, à l'Union européenne, à l'OCDE, à l'OTAN, à l'ONU. Telle n'est pas la vision de tous les pays. L'Europe a longtemps cru qu'elle pouvait jouer un rôle important, mais son intégration a pris beaucoup de temps. Et je passerai quelques instants après pour avoir un peu de recul, mais ce qui est fondamental, c'est de se rendre compte que l'Europe a perdu avec la Deuxième Guerre mondiale et ceux qui en est suivi le rôle primordial qu'elle jouait. Elle est aujourd'hui coincée entre le marteau, je dirais, chinois et l'enclume américaine. Et si nous voulons jouer un rôle au cours de ce siècle, eh bien nous devons avoir une Europe plus forte, plus intégrée. Et nous sommes en train de le faire. Ça, c'est la bonne nouvelle. Et donc, nous devons nous battre pour un monde tripolaire, tripolaire avec trois grands centres, la Chine, les États-Unis et l'Europe. Et il faut que ce triangle soit équilatéral, aussi équilatéral que possible. Donc, je ne néglige pas cette réflexion, elle ne fait pas l'objet de la présentation aujourd'hui, mais je dirais juste un mot. Ce qui en découle, c'est qu'il nous faudra, tôt ou tard, et le, tôt sera le mieux, aussi réfléchir à une défense européenne, car nous ne pouvons pas nous appuyer éternellement euh, sur des alliés qui nous ont certes fait gagner la guerre, mais qui euh, se recroquevillent un peu trop sur eux-mêmes. I'm now going to switch to English. Uh, I think that is a good thing to show that Luxembourgers like languages. And um, I would like to start by saying that uh, you recognize uh, the European construction by the fact that it has lived up to the challenges on a step-by-step -step basis and most of the time when a crisis loomed. Jean Monnet, who is the founding father of Europe together with Robert Schuman, French prime minister and foreign minister, who was half Luxembourger and half French. These two fathers of Europe uh, had this wonderful sentence, Europe will be forged in crisis and will be the sum of the solutions adopted during those crises. Now, we have lived through that just in the last couple of months. And I think this illustrates uh, the topic of my speech, what shall we do together in order to ov overcome all the difficulties that we meet. My presentation will be in two parts, like I've been told to do in France. The first part will be looking back on uh, the global and financial crisis 10 years ago, because there's lessons to learn from that period 
and because uh, Europe has reacted, and then obviously in part two, look at how Europe has reacted in the present crisis. National governments have a bad tendency, and which is the following. They rarely recognize when Europe makes progress. Because when Europe is doing well, they take the merits to themselves. When Europe is doing badly or decisions are taken that they don't like, they say it's the fault of Europe. So this tendency to overemphasize the EU problems and playing down the national ones, so this blame game is dramatic. And when you, we look back since the beginning of Europe, it is a success story for two reasons. It has brought peace to Europe, which was the first goal of Robert Schuman uh, and, and Jean Monnet and Germany and France and Benelux and Italy in the beginning, and it has brought prosperity. Now, for those who doubt that Europe brings prosperity, look at the economic situation of the 10 countries that joined the European Union back in 2004, 10 countries. Look at where they were 16 years ago and where they are now, Poland being the best example of all. Poland not even having had a recession during the last uh, financial crisis, one of the only European countries not to do so. When I joined the, uh, the, the ECOFIN uh, and attended my first meeting back in uh, December 2013, it was the meeting where we agreed on the banking union. My predecessor sitting on that chair was Luc Frieden, and he and his colleagues had worked very hard for a couple of years to find compromise on the banking union. I was lucky, I got there the day they, they decided to, to agree. We had champagne at midnight. And I was keen to read the newspapers the next day. And what was written in the newspapers? Not Europe has agreed on the banking union. It was said they have agreed on the paper, a, a treaty that they're never going to implement. That was the title. Now, that was seven years back. Now, we all know, I'm going to say now a few words on, on, on this, that we have implemented the banking union to 90%. So the commentators were, were wrong. But that's what I, ta what I mentioned about the image of Europe that is not positive enough. And, and failures are talked about all the time and successes are underestimated. So I want to illustrate three things that we have learned in the financial crisis, uh, three pillars of reasoning. Number one, uh, how we have increased stability and investor protection. Two, strengthening the budget rules and the budget discipline amongst us, and three, uh, fairness in taxation. Let me start by speaking about financial stability. As there's many uh, students in the room, uh, this is a, a synonym uh, the, of European action, and it's one of its defaults, is that we use too many acronyms. So as a result of the financial crisis of 2008, we have done, I'm going to mention them, you look them up, and then uh, you just say to yourself if you know them, we've done CRD4, CRR, MIFID2, BRRD, EMIR, AIFMD, USITS5, PREP, and so on and so on. How do you want that anybody understands what we're talking about? But there's another way of describing it. We have done a banking union, uh, and the banking union is consisting of three very simple things. Common supervision, of large banks, called systemic banks, but if you call them large banks, everybody understands. If you call them systemic banks, nobody knows what you're, you're talking about. That supervision is there and uh, is done by the European Central Bank in cooperation with national ones. We have done a single resolution mechanism. That means how do we wind down banks if they have, prob have problems? This is standing and functioning. And we have a fund where all the banks send money to save the failing banks. So failures of banks are going to be financed by the banks themselves. It's there and full standing. And, and third point, uh, a European deposit guarantee scheme, which is not fully at, uh, attained, but at least we have uh, such guarantees up to 100,000 euros for 
uh, at national level. Um, we have done Solvency 2, another acronym that I have not mentioned uh, for the framework for insurance. And we've done many other things so that today the financial stability of banks, the financial stability of countries is much better than uh, it was back then. So we reap the benefits today of the reforms that were done in, 2000, uh, in the lessons of 2008 and that were decided later. The second point is strengthening the fiscal discipline, the budgetary discipline, um, which is known under the name Stability and Growth Pact. Uh, also known under the fact, uh, under the name that we have a European semester, again a wonderful European word. What do you want to imagine under a European semester? Un unless you're a student, you have a semester. But basically it is every country sends in its budget, gets recommendations from the European Union. But that was not easy to set up, but we've managed to do that. And since 2014, the first budget I had to do in the in for the Luxembourg government, you have to do a multi-annual budget. Now that sounds like the most obvious thing in the world. Companies, there are many companies represented here in the room, do that. They do a budget for the year after and then they have a projection for the future. And you better do that because otherwise you have big problems. Now states were often not doing it. Or when they were doing it, they were not doing it seriously. We now have to do it at European level and it works rather fine. What did we do at the euro area level? Well, we created European Stability Mechanism, Mécanisme Européen de Stabilité in French, which helped the countries in the euro crisis. Needless to mention, the Greek crisis and others, five countries benefited from the loans of the ESM. Today, all of these or most of these are repaid. And all the countries prior to the crisis of 2020 of the COVID virus uh, are now, I would say, a little bit out of the woods, to say it in, in very simple terms, and showing that this discipline has worked. I use the sentence uh, quite a lot to say that uh, thanks to um, the discipline that, that we've had, thanks to the ESM and other measures, the euro has overcome its teenage crisis. And when you think back, the, the euro has started uh, in 1999, and then the notes were introduced in 2002, so 1999 to 2020 is 20, so that's where we are today. Now, we have reinforced the European stability mechanism uh, quite uh, recently, last year, uh, to make it the backstop for the single resolution fund and giving European stability mechanism more clout uh, and uh, more power in preventing the crisis. So that's what we've done prior to the COVID crisis. The last important thing that has changed a lot since 2018 is a fairer taxation. Two main elements, transparency, meaning exchanging information between countries. Why has that happened so fast from that day on? Well, because all countries had budget problem and uh, frauds and abuse in tax matters had become unbearable all over the planet. So this transparency step by step was introduced. Luxembourg was in 2016 a, what is called an early adopter of these transparency rules. And uh, basically what we did then, we put our bank secrecy rules, which was a, a long standing tradition into brackets allowing our country to exchange information, not only inside the European Union, but with the rest of the world. By doing so, some thought that our financial center would have huge problems and would eventually disappear. What happened is exactly the contrary. We built up a much better reputation and today our financial center is standing solid and tall uh, despite this change, or maybe as some say, thanks to this change. The other important thing that happened was the uh, BEPS project of OECD, Base Erosion Profit Shifting Initiative, which in three years managed to broker a deal that all OECD countries accepted and which the European Union uh, has implemented much faster than others. Anti-tax avoidance directive one and two were implemented partly also under Luxembourg presidency of the European Union. And so we have today a fairer taxation than in the past, but there's still 
a lot of issues there, especially digital taxation that needs to be tackled. Now, that is what we have done in the last 10 years. And had we not done all this, I tell you, we would be in dire straits today, much more than we are. And had we not done that homework, all of us together, 27 or 28 countries, I think Europe would not have been able to give the response and find the answers that were expected from it. Now, it is clear that when the pandemic started in March, uh, many uh, were saying Europe is absent, but I'm going to tell you that in the beginning, countries themselves had to react. In my own country, uh, we were very fast. Uh, in the sense that we decided measures that were recommended by the OECD, by other organizations, and we have mobilized close to 20% of GDP of measures, some of which are in expenditures, roughly 5% immediate expenditures, helping employees with short labor schemes on the one hand, helping companies with following of loans, uh, moratoria, or uh, with uh, special uh, loans on the one hand. That's the direct expenditures. Then uh, postponing some payments for taxes, social security, and last but not least, guarantees. So 20% of GDP uh, is a huge uh, number, obviously, and we are one of the countries that has dispelled one of the most important answers uh, in terms of quality and quantity. Now, what will, wh why did most countries do that? Well, because GDP fell very rapidly. The latest numbers um, of the OECD signal that for this year they expect worldwide a recession of 4.5%, next year a growth of roughly 5 I've spoken with the chief economist of the OECD today, Laurence Boone. She thinks that probably next year might be more difficult than what is expected, especially if we have a second wave uh, of the pandemic. But this being said, in a nutshell, what it means is two years without growth at best. And two years without growth in our European countries is very difficult uh, to manage because you have a safety net, a social safety net that is extremely costly. And so it will be quite difficult. Um, so where was Europe? Also in the beginning, uh, you could see that countries would have national reactions, closing borders. Now, I come from a country where there's a small little village of 200 inhabitants that you all know. It's called Schengen. And uh, Schengen is the passport-free passport Europe, where you can travel through Europe without your passport freely. Now, I must say the Schengen uh, Convention has suffered a lot in the last couple of months. Because one thing is obvious, the virus doesn't know borders. And it gives the wrong message as a government. If you make fee people think that by closing borders, you're going to vanquish the virus. You're also going to animate nationalistic thinking by doing that. So that was not a good start for Europe. But then we, vo we woke up and for once, the ministers that had the most generous heart were the finance ministers. They don't have that reputation normally, but this, this time they lived up to the challenge. So we decided a three-pronged emergency package with helps from the ESM to the tune of uh, 240 billion euro. We decided uh, to have a guarantee scheme of the European Investment Bank uh, of 25 billion guaranteeing 200 billion for SMEs, and then sure for 100 billion, which is a system to finance short labor uh, at EU level. That was already decided in April. And in fact, Luxembourg was one of the first countries to push for this, as in a letter of the 25th of March, nine countries wrote to Charles Michel, the president of the EU Council, to ask for a common response uh, in this symmetric sanitary crisis. In those nine countries, you have France, all the Mediterranean countries, and Luxembourg. From the very start, 
we were the only AAA country and one of the few northern countries to say, we have to deal with this all together. We are in the same boat. And the measures I just mentioned were then completed in July by the Resilience and Recovery Fund, which was already mentioned in our April decision. So basically, the finance ministers have really prepared for this. And if you add up all these numbers, uh, this, the Resilience and uh, Recovery Fund is 750 billion, most of which by subsidies. And the, the three-pronged uh, uh, response package that I mentioned before, which in total is 540 billion, you have more than a trillion European subsidies or helps that have been decided. We have un entered uncharted territory because the European Union can lend on its behalf. It was never done. Some have called it a Hamiltonian moment. Uh, I, I, I wasn't sure what it meant. I looked it up. I now know that it means historic. Uh, going back to the story of the dollar and, 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 and the construction of the Federation of the United States. Now, you can find that th these uh, measures are too generous. Let me put them in perspective. This 1.1 trillion, you can even add the seven-year budget of the EU to this. If you add all this together, the total of European uh, support is 4.7 percent of GDP over seven years. So it's 0 0.7 percent per year. Is that too much? Certainly not. But it is a credible response. If you look at uh, what national economies do in terms of percentage of cent GDP, I mentioned the Luxembourg number is 20 percent. You see that this European response which is a world premiere, is high, but compared to what national governments have to do and have done, is, is not so large. So I think it's balanced. With solidarity goes also responsibility. And also the fact that, as I mentioned, the national response uh, is much higher, uh, calls for action later in the day, in a couple of months, or when the pandemic is over, to take also serious and responsible uh, action at national level. Now, what is key now, and I'm coming to the end of, of my uh, presentation, is how we get out of this crisis. Now, with all this European money and with all these national means that uh, are made available, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to use that money? And I think here comes probably the most important element. We have to use that money smartly to do two things, being responsible by making sustainable investments and sustainable finance, and second, invest in the digital economy. These are the two priorities that the European Com Commission has highlighted since uh, 18 months. And we must use that, those European funds to achieve exactly that to make our economies stronger and to innovate. Now, the discussion is going on about this. I'm pretty confident that we're going to achieve that. This being said, we have to realize that the Europe of today, in terms of financial firepower, is much weaker than it was 10 years ago. If uh, you look at uh, the banks, uh, the 10 largest banks, there were five in the top 10, 10 years ago. There's only one left. If you look at uh, asset managers and asset management, uh, in the top 10 asset managers, nine are American. And they encompass 95% of assets. So we have to wake up. But that's what we're doing in this crisis. It's high time, but we are doing it. We need um, to have a capital markets union that goes more deeply. But uh, as we discussed just now, we have to give it a better name. Um, and uh, maybe uh, that will help to achieve that result. Let's also not lose sight of the fact that Europe has been very good at regulating data protection. Um, financial regulation. Sometimes this is only portrayed negatively. Let's make that a strength. 
I give you two examples. In terms of payment, we have two directives, the most recent one is Payment Services Directive 2, is the most sophisticated piece of uh, legislation in this area in the world. Everybody is looking at Europe in that area because we have found the right balance. It is the standard. The same has happened for USITs or alternative investment funds in the past, where Europe has set the bar very high, has set the standard that everybody else uses. So let's continue into that direction to make sure that we have the right players uh, for the digital challenge. Who is the largest winner uh, of the crisis today? Well, the e-commerce companies. There's no doubt about that. Now, we have very few large European players in this area, so we need to foster and boost them and uh, have the right and smart regulation to do it, on the one hand, need the fair taxation also in this area to be able to build back better. Three Bs, build back better. Build back is recuperate what we're losing in the two years now, to this year and next year, and better means quality. Which leads me to, to my last point, which is sustainability. Sustainability will be key in the recovery plan. It is already key in many of our countries. Did you know that uh, more than half of the sustainable or green bonds that are issued are issued in euro? So the currency for sustainable investment is the euro. Quite interesting point. Did you know that more than half of all sustainable bonds are listed at the, Europe, at the Luxembourg Green Exchange, which is part of the Luxembourg Stock Exchange? So one bond out of two that is green or sustainable is listed there. Did you know that uh, Luxembourg has just issued a sustainability bond of 1.5 billion euro, and it is a premiere in the world. We've issued that uh, beginning of September, and uh, it was a great success, despite the fact that it was a premiere. It's an ESG bond. It has environmental and climate investments on one hand and uh, social impact investments on the other hand. It was oversubscribed 13 times. So markets are waiting for such product and uh, are rewarding those who go into that direction. At the same time, we have, and that will be my last point on sustainability, we have set up the framework beginning of September after which we issued that bond, but that framework already contains all the latest legislation uh, in terms of sustainable finance, including the taxonomy of the EU directives. So what you don't see but promise it is here on my chest the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 ones and 17 colors, are part of my agenda on an everyday basis. And uh, obviously in this framework that we set up, these goals are also included. So, in conclusion, what I would like for you to remember is very simple. Number one, Europe has grown, Europe, European Union has grown step by step has succeeded every time there was a crisis, has learned from that crisis, and has integrated more. We've done that most recently in 2008. We are doing it right now. And despite the technical aspects of all the things that I've mentioned, the key of all this is that if we move ahead together, we will live in peace and prosperity. But let's not be fooled. There's many people out there who played the card of nationalism. And nationalism equals war. François Mitterrand said, le nationalisme, c'est la guerre. Let's never forget that. The European history is full of such experiences. So the lessons I learned is, let us work together for a better and sustainable economy, which will guarantee our prosperity and let us work together inside Europe and outside Europe for multilateralism, because multilateralism is the only way for peace. Thank you very much.
you very much for this stimulating presentation. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of questions in the room. We have someone, someone with a microphone here. Yes, please. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm a master's student here at UCP, and I have a question about Luxembourg. Um, we know that Luxembourg is really involved in green finance as evidenced by the Luxembourg Green Exchange, which was the first platform that is entirely dedicated to green and sustainable financial instruments. Uh, so my question is, um, what is the government's strategy in order to develop even more uh, Luxembourg in uh, terms of green finance? Shall I take a microphone? Yeah, I think. Oh, this here? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I think sustainable finance is there to stay, and we're just in the initial stages. Uh, our country has set up a uh, sustainable finance initiative uh, over the last couple of years that we have built up together with the United Nations plan uh, for environment. I work very closely with the Minister of Environment on this. Uh, as uh, President Jose mentioned, I attended uh, the Kyoto Conference back in 1997 when the Kyoto Protocol uh, was established and agreed and I was the speaker, uh, spokesperson for the whole uh, European Union. So uh, for me, sustainable finance is in my blood. I, I really believe that it's the only way we can cope with climate change. Um, and, and if we want to gear and uh, uh, <coughs> direct, redirect our economies, towards um, healthy growth, finance needs to be sustainable. Every project needs finance. So if finance is sustainable, then you can redirect, reorientate projects. Now, we, we see that in the investment fund industry. Uh, the, each investment fund uh, today has some concern in this matter. So what we would like to encourage, and which the European Union has been able to do with the taxonomy, is agree on rules to make sure that any financial product really reaches the standard. So what we must avoid is the greenwashing, making sure that we really go for the real thing and we have exclusion lists of investments that we uh, make sure that certain projects will not be financed by, by some, but it's a step-by-step -step approach. So the fact that we now have European standards, the taxonomy is key, is happening right in front of our eyes, and having responsible players, banks, investment funds is key. So we are lucky in Luxembourg, we have a financial center that has 130 banks, thousands of investment funds, with a, a net asset value of uh, close to five trillion euro, so we have the players there, we have the framework, we have invented a new framework for sustainable bonds. We're going to work with others. We have a cooperation with the European Investment Bank, the largest one institution in the world for issuing bonds and green bonds on in particular. So we have all the players uh, there and uh, we are obviously reaching out to all the countries because all this needs to be done at European and world level. We also do that with the IMF amongst others. So. It's a cooperative, uh, mutual effort that we need here. Good evening, Mr. Minister. Um, thank you for being here and for your, ins ins yes, your speech, sorry. Um, I have a question about solidarity in the EU. Uh, you made it quite clear in your speech that uh, in order to face the COVID-19 uh, crisis, we needed to implement um, uh, health and uh, financial uh, solidarity uh, on a European scale. Do you personally believe that um, the EU could be inspired by the model of uh, solidarity that is now in place in the greater region of uh, Luxembourg? Um. Well, I think uh, s solidarity lives uh, at uh, different levels. You have solidarity between people in the neighborhood, you have solidarity in the village, in the regions, in the countries. You mentioned the greater region, which maybe not everybody realizes what it means. It, it's in fact the, 
regions around Luxembourg in, in Belgium, uh, Germany and France, we have some cooperation there. Uh, and then you have the, the, the national level and then you have the international level. Uh, the interplay between all these uh, entities uh, is key. I think what we have just decided now at European level is really a um, game changer because it tells us and shows to us that we are in the same boat in Europe. It was always my, since March, my main argument was to say the virus doesn't know any borders. The vi virus doesn't know different nationalities. He hits everybody the same way. The rich, the poor, the Polish, the Luxembourgers, the Germans, the French. And we have the chance to have a European Union. We are already in the same boat. We have to make that boat safer, larger, uh, so that we can sail through this storm. So this is what is happening. And uh, this Hamiltonian moment, uh, I, I can say a few words on this. Uh, in the beginning of the crisis, the idea came up of Corona bonds. Maybe some of you remember that discussion. Corona bonds, I, I, I was part of those who supported that. I think it was a good idea. It says today we take, take up loans together and get a good rating because uh, those countries that are have good uh, financial uh, public finances will ensure that we get a good rate. But that's not as good as what we have decided because what we have decided is that the European Commission goes on the markets and takes up loans, but then together <coughs> we decide what we do with those funds and we gear them towards sustainable investments, towards uh, a, clean, uh, a clean world and towards digital preparedness. So this is much better than just issuing bonds together. And it's, I think, more consistent with the idea of having a common ship that sails through the storm because you want to do things that benefit to all of us. So health expenditures will be part of the solution, but also the, the, the things I mentioned about digital and uh, environment will be part of that solidarity. Hello, Mr. Dorinia, thank you for being here. So uh, I had a question about uh, Luxembourg's recovery plan because the French plan known as France Relance is 40% uh, uh, funded by the European Union and the part that is dedicated to the ecological, transi uh, to the ele ecological transition uh, represents uh, 30 billion euros and uh, the, the sectors that are targeted by this plan are construction, uh, agriculture and uh, energy. So uh, what uh, about Luxembourg's uh, recovery plan? Well, I have, uh, for those who wouldn't know it, bad news here, we will basically not benefit from the recovery plan. We'll, we're going to be in proportionately one of the countries that pays most and uh, proportionately one of the countries that gets out le least. But that's fine. Um, this is about solidarity. So we have plans, but uh, they are only to a small extent based on m subsidies from the recovery plan. They would probably be geared mostly towards health, the ones that we will get from Europe. For the rest, our priorities, uh, which have been already enshrined in the budget for many years, uh, will be in the field uh, of environment, of, uh, uh, of climate change, uh, of construction. I've been since a couple of years in Luxembourg, every house uh, that is built is a passive house. So that's already functioning. And, and we're going to increase the subsidies for the older homes that are not yet at the best level of uh, energy efficiency. Uh, and then we've taken a measure this year, which I think is very spectacular and got a lot of attention. Since March of this year, we have free public transportation in the whole country. So uh, this is the first time that uh, this is implemented in the world. And this is a great contribution uh, to climate change in the sense that it encourages people to use public transportation instead of taking the car or using 
their own uh, way of transportation. So it's a cocktail of things that we're going to do. On top of that, we have done our plan, which is the Plan de Relance in France. It's called New Start in Luxembourg. It was announced and implemented uh, in, in June, and it's being, uh, it's being done. Maybe one thing here that is important, and you've done the same in France, you have some sectors that have been hit uh, harder than others. Uh, and that's in particular restaurants, hotels, tourism, culture, uh, and uh, event uh, organizers. I mentioned those five, there are certainly a few others, uh, travel agencies, for example. And the, with, for these sectors, we have devised a special scheme, special program, because these sectors cannot rebound immediately. They are still hurt by the distances that we need to keep, by the limitations of guests you can have, and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, coming back uh, to what I said at the very beginning of this conference, it is very good that we continue to have uh, auditoria like this one filled with students with the necessary distance, with the mask, with the necessary precautions. We need to live with the virus, find the, ri find the right solution. And those sectors that cannot cope with those limits or for, the, for those who it is very difficult to cope for, for these difficulties, Obviously, that's why you need public money, public support, and that's what we're doing. Okay, I'll be shorter. Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, one last question. Um, do you think that Luxembourg would be willing to partake in a common European fiscal policy in order to, let's say, uh, finance the, uh, the, the solidarity and a more sustainable world? Um, what, what do you mean by, you mean common budget policies when you say fiscal, or you mean taxes? Taxes. Ah, okay. Taxes. Now, in, yeah, it's interesting. In, you know, in the English language, you can use the word fiscal for, for budget issues, and so your question was about taxes. Yes. Now, uh, I, I mentioned taxes in my presentation. Uh, we've come a long way in Europe and even in the world in this area. Prior to 2008, uh, taxation uh, was uh, freewheeling, I would say, uh, all over the world. And in the last 10 years, the international landscape of taxation has changed more than in the 100 years before. Uh, it was high time to modernize uh, the landscape of taxation because it was not up to date anymore with the new ways of production. It was not up to date with the digital economy. So the European Union is a pioneer in this area. We have implemented most of the measures that the OECD has recommended and are already in place, are already in place, not only in Luxembourg, but in all European countries. And it's good like that. Now, uh, there's, in fact, one big issue that is not solved because it was not agreed at the level of the OECD. The BEPS 1 action is about digital taxation. And you see, uh, I think it's an interesting topic that you read a lot about. Uh, the situation is the following. Some countries have introduced digital taxes at the national level. It's the case uh, in, in a couple of European countries. Um, and uh, it really creates a lot of um, difficulties amongst countries because that digital is flowing through the, uh, around the planet. How do you tax a digital service? Where do you tax it? So that's why the OECD is working on it, to find a common solution to ensure a level playing field. We, as Luxembourg, are totally in favor of that. We proactively work on that. Some European ministers, including uh, Bruno Le Maire, have uh, insisted that if we do not find a solution at EU level, we, uh, sorry, at OECD level, we should do that at a European level. Well, Luxembourg is, is, uh, in, agrees with that in the sense that we say, okay, we can anticipate at European level for a limited period of time, showing the way to others. But if we do that in the long run, alone on our own, and if our taxes are high, well, they're going to discourage anybody to use Europe as a starting point or a headquarter for digital business. So uh, let's do it in a smart way. 
Uh, and I'm confident that uh, Europe can be a pioneer if it does it smart. Good. Smartly was the last word. I think that's a good finish. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. to move to the ceremony of Dr. Maurice Cosa. Uh, I will invite uh, our president, Philippe Ouzet, to come here, our, our dean, Franck Bournois, and our executive vice president, Leon Lolida. Can I take a seat? Yes, smartly was uh, the last word, and it may be um, the first of my introduction, if you allow me. As dean of the school, I'm very happy to um, meet you all and welcome you uh, at ESCP, and especially within the context of that great uh, brand name, Standard for a Sustainable World. Um, dear ministers, now that I know the protocol allows to uh, mention the two together, uh, Your Excellency, dear uh, presidents, colleagues, uh, guests, and of course, dear students from uh, all of our uh, European countries. Uh, let me thank on behalf of everyone, uh, Pierre Gramegna, for his uh, outstanding uh, conference in this lecture room tonight. I think uh, you gave us uh, a lot of uh, lessons, especially uh, lessons of hope, especially when you said in, the, in, in your um, conclusions that using money would be used to innovate, build back better. And uh, I also learned the proportion of uh, green bonds being uh, listed at uh, Luxembourg. Um, there would be a lot to say because we've been impressed by the, uh, the vision developed by Luxembourg as a state and also by your um, personal uh, foresight and uh, uh, financial acumen. But now we are being gathered for a very special event. I'm saying this to students for a very special part of this evening, a moment when the Mr. Pierre Gramegna will be awarded um, ESCP's doctorate uh, honoris causa. I'm saying this for students. Uh, and first of all, let me explain what this is, because this is a rather rare ceremony with just a few recipients at ESCP. And uh, amongst the very recent um, recipients, we had Mr. Michel Barnier, an alumnus of this school, but also Jeff Emelt of General Electric, and others. And uh, an honorary doctorate uh, is an academic degree which a university has waived in terms of the usual uh, requirements. That means that uh, Pierre Gamignot did not attend lessons and courses, that he didn't take exams. And, uh, students are feeling very, very bad about this, I'm sure. And uh, traditional dissertation, there was none. However, from the Latin phrase honoris causa, this is a doctorate awarded for the sake of the honor. Th this is, in, the in, in many ways, a medieval practice, as it was the University of Oxford which first delivered a doctorate honoris causa to somebody who then became the Bishop of Salisbury. But there is no correlation with your ne next destination in office. Uh, um, I hope uh, you understand also that in the US afterwards, some time after, in the late uh, 1773, I think, Harvard University started also the practice. And in France, it came, it became a little bit more, uh, it came to France a little bit later, uh, 100 years ago, in ninth, after the end of, World War, uh, of the First World War. So there were people, as you said, 
uh, writing books on the second of, on the First World War. There were books probably on the Spanish flu, but even fewer books <laughs> on, on the French decree uh, about um, recognizing the good services rendered, good word in English, rendered to science, art, and of course also to other academic fields. At ESCP, just for your good knowledge, the decision of a non-honorary doctorate is a decision made jointly by the dean of the school and the dean of faculty with some um, propositions made um, uh, by uh, faculty. We are delighted tonight, and I'm sure you will uh, all join me in this, um, as a university, a business school, uh, as ESCP is a university in many other countries in, uh, uh, in France, to welcome you as representatives of uh, the Luxembourg communities and, of course, also of the ESCP communities here tonight. For those who didn't pay special attention or notice, this was the first part. The second is now about uh, Mr. Pierre Gramegna, um, who uh, is going to be honored getting the recognition of, the, uh, of ESCP, as I said, uh, of all of its campuses in, uh, of course, Paris, where we are here tonight. It's only one of the campuses that we have in Paris, but it's going to be also with some good students from other countries, Italy, Spain, and, 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 and so on. Um, I wanted to say that uh, there are many ways to uh, hold such a ceremony. But I know also that Mr. Pierre Gramegna did not want this event this evening to be too ceremonial. So we will uh, just uh, stay and hold to the uh, essentials of all this. So uh, I fear, Mr. Minister, that your sense of uh, modesty and humility might suffer for a little short while as I'm going to express some of the, some of the many reasons for which uh, this institution made the decision to award this distinguished um, title. And I will uh, probably not be as um, innovative as you have been in um, placing this under the banner of the four letters of ESCP. In other words, excellence, singularity, S, C for creativity, and P for pluralism. Because everyone knows in this room, as certainly amongst uh, students and, fac and, 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 uh, and, and faculty and staff, that these are the key and central values of this school. Excellence. I'm not going to uh, speak here about excellence or the excellence of your personality traits, uh, but I heard a lot of very good uh, stories and anecdotes about your openness and your unfailing support to team members, and that is very important in terms of dynamics. A doctorate has undoubtedly something to do with excellence. And uh, Mr. Graben, you asked her, did. I reassure the students, by the way, that uh, we do award degrees with respect. Uh, he, he got and studied law and economics in Paris, and you said so, where you did earn your uh, degrees, if I'm not wrong, in um, civil law, economics, and even European law. So that was something that was uh, already a little seed uh, far back. Professional excellence, of course. Um, in the way that you have managed, and you said so, the finances, the budgets of Luxembourg over, over the last years, and also you have um, clear European and international recognition um, with your sitting on the board of uh, governors of the European Investment Bank and other things like a governor of Luxembourg at the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, Asian Bank De of Development, and also, I'm not missing Africa. For singularity, there is something very distinctive here at ESCP, which are the sense, the living of the European values. And, and, and you are a true, genuine, honest, 
I would even go as far as to say indisputable European citizen. Um, you said it, but even if you were not saying it, everybody would say. You have this rare ability to navigate um, different cup, uh, European cultures, and you have those um, European sensitivities. Of course, Luxembourg is always first, but you understand the many different national cultures in which your country, uh, with which your country is working. You are fluent in many European languages, like Luxembourgese, and there are students in this room who made the decision that you passed. <laughs> um, French also, Italian, English, and more. In that, you are a clear example, and you are a figurehead for many of our students here in the school, because you incarnate that diversity that is so important and that we teach here at ESCP, a diversity that is helping individuals and uh, organizations, be they private or public, and, and you have also that sensitivity for those different uh, sectors. Creativity, I should be very uh, short on this because your uh, lecture and uh, the contents, but also the style, showed tonight that how much that creativity there is. Um, and I think we learned a lot about your views on uh, sustainability. You mentioned fairer taxation. Uh, you said it, you, you said, uh, early adopter for Luxembourg of, 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 of many um, aspects and elements of uh, transparency, solidarity and sustainability shaping the future of the EU. And, and, and as there was the uh, title of your uh, lecture on, on the wall, I even thought that maybe there was a new word like sustainability, which was that uh, contraction, condensation of sustainability and solidarity. We value very much that you are one of the very few um, finance ministers participating in the climate conferences, and I'm sure that the Associate Dean for uh, Sustainability at ESCP will have uh, pointed that out, and that uh, like something we have very uh, dear in our hearts here is the um, priority. And you have had this too in your uh, ministerial action. Mr. Gramenia, uh, you have also launched a lot of uh, initiatives and I know that uh, uh, students uh, also um, grasped, seized, that uh, you had launched the Luxembourg Intergenerational Sovereign Fund, I think, and that was uh, back some years ago, focusing on the well-being of future generations with that time factor that is so important. Regarding the P uh, about pluralism, uh, and we like this also, we cherish this very much at ESCP, um, we, we, we love profiles with pluralism. And, and my good colleagues, uh, Bertrand and, 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 and Professor Leluza, who's the academic dean for the school, keep saying good students not only study management and business, but they study it with A, B, C, D, E. It's not just the beginning of the alphabet. It's also that management and business must be learned alongside A for arts, of course, with business for B, cultures for C, D is diplomacy, and E is engineering. And in terms of diplomacy, there are diplomats in this room. Um, pluralism is very, very important. And, and, and I think that you are also incarnating this um, crossroads area um, between the different disciplines that um, this uh, school and university is uh, teaching. Not only did you something like, what was it, 30 years back, uh, you were a, a consul general uh, um, uh, in San Francisco, but also Asia what was part of your uh, remits and scope. Uh, and, and you were an ambassador of Luxembourg to Japan. Was it also South Korea? Uh, I think I, I read that. And you negotiated, Philippe Pouzet uh, 
said it in his um, opening uh, speech, uh, and that was uh, more than uh, 20 years ago uh, when you helped with the um, Kyoto Protocol and uh, Luxembourg's uh, presidency. So the world of business is also uh, welcoming very much um, such initiatives, uh, and, and you um, enhanced this as you were the Director General of the Chamber of Commerce, and, and, I, and I must say that um, uh, President uh, Philippe Pouzet, but also the President of the Chamber, and, and, and uh, Stéphane Pratacci here as Director General of the, of, of the Chamber of, uh, of, of, of uh, the Paris region, um, um, Chamber of Commerce. Everybody is going to join me in recognizing how important it is to unite the strengths of the private public sector, especially also with an international dimension. You have an experience of this business world and also of, of the public sphere. Again, we are proud to hear that you took an active part in the Economic Development Committee and the National Committee for the Promotion of Entrepreneurship. And as uh, many of you know, the notion of entrepreneurship was coined in this uh, very school back uh, 200 years ago uh, by one of its uh, early founders, Jean-Baptiste Say, a famous 19th century economist. The school, therefore, without uh, further ado, is absolutely glad, proud, and honored uh, to award you this evening the title of Dr. Honoris Causa of ESCP for all of your uh, production, for all of your service, uh, for the benefit of uh, academia and the business world. And this is going to be symbolically uh, bestowed upon you by the president of the school in in uh, presenting you with the uh, insignia. So for those of you who wonder why there are th three rows, uh, these three rows do correspond to the uh, three levels of uh, academic knowledge. Bachelor level, first row. Second row, it's always a very difficult uh, <laughs> thing to do. This is why I have time for speaking. Uh, it's very hard, but usually there is a little pin, a metallic pin to be used. Uh, second row is master level, and last row is the doctoral level. And having said this, with perfect timing with the president of the school, we now have Again, a distinguished uh, Dr. Honoris Causa. Congratulations, and we are very proud of this event. And Let me present you with the uh, official uh, diploma thereof. Oops. Congratulations. Thanks. Merci, Francois. Well, um, you are glad, uh, honored, and I don't know, there was not a word, but I'm overwhelmed. So I, I, uh, I would like to say that, uh, yes, I'm pri privileged and honored to receive this. Dr. Honoris Causa, but through me, uh, those who are honored here are all the teams that work with me all my life. And you've mentioned them. It's the diplomats that work with me, my bosses, uh, all the ambassadors I work for, and those that work with me, uh, the 20 years in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, back in Luxembourg, in Paris, San Francisco, Tokyo, 
It goes to all the people that work with me in the Chamber of Commerce, my bosses there, the elected members, and the whole team that worked with me, including uh, Carlo Tillen, who is here with me today and who, who is my successor, brilliant successor. Uh, and then uh, uh, also to my team in the Ministry of Finance. They are wonderful people, hardworking. They're great people. And uh, I think they deserve this as much as I do. So um, I thank them all. And uh, I also would like to thank uh, Luc Frieden for being here because he's my predecessor and uh, he has uh, different charges amongst them. He's the president of the Chamber of Commerce. You see, in Luxembourg, we all work together as a big family. And that's what makes our strength. Congratulations to this wonderful school, it's the oldest uh, business school in the world. I can promise that uh, I will be, uh, between quotation marks, uh, ambassador of this school in the world. And I will do my utmost to make sure that the cooperation that has been initiated with Luxembourg through the Chamber of Commerce and OSCP will be fruitful and will develop over the years. Thank you. Thanks to Serge Rendimini, who uh, really introduced us to each other. I see that we can do lots of great things together. This is only a start. Thank you very much. I would like to invite Mr. Luc Frieden to join us, President of the Chamber of Commerce of Luxembourg. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, uh, allow me to congratulate uh, Minister Gramenia <coughs> for this award, which is of course a recognition, like any reward that you get for you as a person. But if you receive such an award as a minister, it's also recognition for the country that you represent. And a lot was has been said tonight. We already tried to build on that and to further develop that between Luxembourg and France. And indeed many business leaders and many political leaders of our country have studied in France, including Minister Gramini and myself and many others in this audience. But we strongly believe also at the Chamber of Commerce, which in Luxembourg is the official representation of all companies. And they are forced by law, by the way, to be a member of the Chamber of Commerce. So we think that education is extremely important for the social and economic development of a country and of Europe. And that's why just before this ceremony, President Luizé and uh, myself, together with our Director Generals, signed an agreement between the Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce and the OSCP to make sure that education does not only take place at the level of where many of you are in the back rows, where you get the basis of what you need to be successful business people, but also thereafter, in your life as uh, managers, you continue to develop the skills you need to make your companies successful. And that's why we are extremely grateful <coughs> at the Chamber of Commerce to have OSCP as a partner, and I would say a leader in helping us develop these programs that make, make sure that executive education is something that has the stamp of a distinguished business school like OSCP that brings us the tools and brings our members the tools to be also successful after this crisis. I think even more in times of crisis, you need to have courage and you need to have skills. And the skills can be delivered by academic programs and also by executive education. That's why I think on the basis of the agreement we signed today, on the basis of some experience that we shared over the past three years, I think we can develop the programs we need to have successful business people that think, by the way, also cross-border. I like very much that in your mission, you state that you are driven by European values. And I think a lot what Minister Gramenia said today, a lot what um, uh, the President and Director General of your school said, is we are bound by European values. And if we think cross-border, if we look at the tools that the one 
and the other that uh, people have on, on various aspects across the globe, I think then we will be stronger and we will develop the growth that we need to be successful and to have the social and economic uh, development that we need on a sustainable uh, basis, of course, but I think we need growth and therefore we need a skip. And that's, again, I would like to thank you heartily on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce for having agreed to enter into this uh, partnership and it should be a partnership and look forward to many fruitful exchanges with this group. Thank you very much. Thank you.